Listening to is a performance of Zemer Shakaze, a song such as this, from a performance by our guest artist this afternoon, Nurit Hirsch, at the 2018 North American Jewish Choral Festival, where she was honored. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jerry Skolnick. Uh, for the past just about 40 years, I have served as the rabbi of the Forest Hills Jewish Center in Queens here in New York City but I also serve as the Vice President of the Zamir Choral Foundation, and it is in that capacity that I'm honored to host this program today. I first sang with the Zamir Chorale in 1969, 50 years ago, and I can say without reservation that the experience changed my life and my relationship, not only with music, but also with the Jewish community and Jewish life as a whole. It also introduced me to another guy who was singing tenor at the same time, someone named Mati Lazar. Our friendship goes back that far and has only become deeper and richer through the years. A few words before I introduce our participants today. First, we are of course aware that today's program is taking place during the nine days, just a few brief days before Tisha B'Av one of the saddest days in the Jewish calendar year. Musical performances are frowned upon during this time frame, and were today's program to be a performance, it would surely be questionable. But I want to emphasize that today's program is not a performance, even though it contains a few musical numbers. It is rather an instructional program on the history and the evolution of Israeli music primarily through the lens of one of its very remarkable, even iconic contributors. 
One additional note on that subject. It's worth noting how very critical and indeed indispensable music itself has been in the cause of giving expression to the Jewish experience, not least in times of crisis. From Salomone Rossi's magnificent setting of Psalm 137, Al Naharot Bavel, to more contemporary performers, music has always been a critical component of how we have responded to the world around us in bad times as well as in good times. It's worth noting also that Nurit Hirsch's music has also expressed the full range of human emotions and experiences from joy and celebration to loss and longing. And it is in that spirit that we consider her work today. Second, please note that after today, the Zamir Coral Foundation's program, Taking Note, of which today's program is a part, will be on hiatus as we move on to other programs and activities. And now, on to our program. It is a singularly great honor and a personal pleasure for me to welcome our special guest this afternoon, the legendary Israeli composer, arranger, and conductor, Nurit Hirsch. Many of you participating today are no doubt familiar with the idea of what's called the Great American Songbook, that collection of songs that in some ethereal way gives expression through music to the ethos of American culture and society. In welcoming Nurit here this afternoon, I can say without reservation that she is one of the most noteworthy contributors and prolific contributors to what might fairly be called the Great Israeli Songbook. In her long career, she has composed over 1,600 songs, including Ose Shalom and Bashana Haba'a, as you'll hear later, Hashoter Azulai, Perach Halilach, my personal favorite, as Nurit knows, Rakbi Yisrael, and Abani B. Nurit has represented Israel in many prestigious music festivals around the world, and in 1978, her song Abani B won first prize in the Eurovision Song Contest, becoming a big international hit with versions in several languages. She also composed the soundtrack for 14 films, including Hashoter, The Policeman, which won the Golden Globe as Best Foreign Film in 1972 and was nominated for an Oscar in that same category. Perhaps best known to many of her American admirers is the hit musical Salah Shabbati, for which she composed the iconic score and conducted the orchestra during its entire five-year run at the Habima Theater in Tel Aviv. There is much to say about Nurit and not enough time, but as a great admirer and longtime devotee of the great Israeli songbook, here's what I would say. Hammerstein had Rogers, Lowe had Lerner, Bach had Harnick, and even Stephen Sondheim had Bernstein. Virtually every great lyricist in Israeli music history has had Nurit to work with and some of their greatest and longest lasting work resulted from their creative partnerships with Nurit. What a great honor it is to have her with us today. And of course, we welcome Matthew Lazar, the founder and director of the Zamir Choral Foundation, who has created the Renaissance of Jewish choral music in North America. As the conductor of the Zamir Chorale, founder of the North American Jewish Choral Festival, Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, and Zamir Noded, he has created and promoted transdenominational, transgenerational, and transpolitical Jewish music communities for over 40 years. He has conducted choral and choral orchestral Jewish themed concerts across the United States and Israel, and has conducted the great cantors of this generation. He was a co-founder of Teku, the first American Hebrew folk rock brand. It is a great pleasure 
to turn the mic, as it were, over to Mati and to listen to him and to Nurit talk to each other. Mati? Thank you so much, Jerry, for all your beautiful words and your placement of our program in the Jewish calendar today. And thank you for all, to all of you for joining me and joining us today. Uh, and of course, thank you very much, Nurit, uh, for staying up so late and joining us from Tel Aviv. Uh, no small feat, I know. Uh, we just heard Zemer Shekazeh, uh, which is really a song about a song that's so popular that not only do, does everybody sing it, but the birds sing it, and the fish sing it, it goes over the electric wires. And I always think of you because you've written so many songs that everyone loves to sing. How old were you, Nuri, when you first understood that music was going to play such a large part in your life? Since my early childhood, I was drawn to music. I was attracted to music. Um, th this was my life from the beginning. Um, when I was a baby, my father used to sing for me opera, arias from operas. He was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia, and in Czechoslovakia he was a um, he was the uh, violinist and the an opera singer and uh, he used to sing for the opera. So uh, in parallel to the opera, when I was a child, we didn't have, ta uh, we didn't have uh, money for, um, for living, for renting, um, for renting um, an apartment. And uh, we used to live uh, at my grandparents' Uh, house and my grandparents were religious Jews and uh, in holidays and uh, Shabbat they used to take me to the synagogue and I listened to the cantor sings the wonderful Hasidic mel Hasidic melodies and I, I fell in love with the Hasidic music and it it, uh, it, it it inspired me later to write you were uh, uh, talented as a child, I'm sure. Did your parents encourage you? Did you take piano lessons or any other music lessons? They always encouraged me. And uh, my mother used to, to sit near me. I forced her to sit near me and uh, to, to listen to my scales. I was... <laughs> Before that, I didn't have a piano. I played in the, in the neighbor's piano, and the, they had a piano, and they let me play. I played sc scales all day. <laughs> And she, the poor mother had to, to listen, and the neighbors told my mother, Mrs. Hirsch, tell your daughter to change their repertoire. So this was my childhood, playing the piano, again and again scales. I'm sure your neighbor was happy you didn't, or not interested in playing the drums, because then the whole school <laughs> would have come after you. What, well, what kind of... <laughs> What kind of uh, music do you remember from your childhood besides the beautiful melodies of the Chazan? Uh, is there, did you play Mozart and what other music yes. was in your My favorite uh, composer is Mozart. Hmm. He's my favorite of all uh, composers, Mozart. A good choice, a good choice. A genius choice, of course. Yes, he was, he was simple. He was genius in his, in his simplicity. You know, as, since you're an orchestral composer as well, you'll appreciate this very famous story about Mozart that he would write the first movement of a symphony, but he would write out the second violin part of the movement straight, which is, for those of you who aren't musical, it's like doing the New York Times crossword puzzle and filling in all the E's and then going back and going forth. That's what a genius that he was. It's hard for us to even imagine that kind of brilliance. I agree. Yeah. Tell me, what kind of uh, 
what kind of music making did you have in your life when you were in high school? When I was in high school, I played the piano all day, not all night because I like to go to sleep very early. And um, when I was in, uh, in high school, I started inventing melodies. I didn't have lyricists, I didn't know anybody. So I first, I, I, I um, composed my first melody, Pera Halilach, the lilac, lilac flower. Beautiful song. What? I say it's such a beautiful song. I know that Jerry is it's Jerry's favorite and many other people as well. Well, Jerry has a good taste. <laughs> you know how uh, it became known? Uh, I was in an entertainment, co uh, army entertainment troupe. And one day we had a celebration, a, a party of the commanders of the armored, armored corps. This was my lahaka. Shirion. Shirion. Toda. So, it was a very good atmosphere, very nice atmosphere, and there was a flegel piano, grand piano, and my friends in the lahaka said, Nurit, why don't you play your first melody? I didn't have lyrics yet. So I played, and when I finished, a little woman, round woman, with fast steps came to me and said, said Nurit, how ni what a nice melody. Why, why shouldn't you um, add words to it? And who was it? Nomi Shemer. I didn't know it was Nomi Shemer. And you know, she always had a good word to say to me. When I won the Abani B, the Eurovision Song Contest, she wrote in the, on the, in the paper, Chapeau. And when she had grandchildren, she told me how wonderful are my children's songs that they are, they are loving my children's songs. I don't know if you know, Dig Dig Doob. Will you play a little? It's a series of songs, it's 100 songs. We don't have time for all the 100. So this was the army period. Yeah. Zimmer, Zimmer Shekaze, uh, I know, used to be the audition piece for a, a, aspiring singers who wanted to join the entertainment corps. What is it about that uh, melody and that, that song that made it such an important part of an audition? I discovered it only lately. I was not aware of it because I was not anymore in the business of uh, entertainment in the army. But I, I was thinking a lot about it. Why? The only the only answer I can imagine is because they changed the rhythm. Maybe they they wanted to know if you can if you have rhythm sense. Maybe. Yeah, the, yeah, the I meter mean, changes. Yeah? yeah. Yes, you know, I hate rhythm changes in the middle of the song. This is my only song that changes the rhythm in the middle of the song. I just hate it. But the words made me change. It was ah. three quarters. Three quarters and then he changed the rhythm. I, I was forced to change the rhythm. This is Yaakov Rotblit. But you know, ya Yaakov Rotblit, we call it him Yankale Rotblit. Yankale. And this was his first song. He was a soldier in the army. He was not, he didn't have the technique. Later he became very famous, a very fine lyricist. 
and uh, there is a story, you know it, Martin, the story how he found out that I wrote the song. One day he told me after many years that what happened when I played for him on the telephone the song, I was very excited and I called him on the telephone and I, and I, I was cheerful and he was in the middle of, he lost his leg in the, in the army, in the war, six day war, and he was, uh, putting uh, their, the doctors were putting prosthesis to his leg. So on, he was putting the prosthesis and I played Zemer <laughs> Shekaze. Only is in Israel, only, only in a situation like this. Exactly right. Uh, you, you mentioned Perach Halilach. Um, how did you, it was just, you just wrote it, Stam, and uh, did you know, how did Uri Asaf get involved in writing the words for that? I don't remember, it was 40 years ago, but I know that he put very romantic and lyric, and uh, you know, there is a story that, she, that he told me lately, why the lilac tree? His, his brother used to, go, to come to him, to visit him, and there was near the door lilac flower. And he told me that his brother committed suicide. And every time he sees the lilac uh, flower, he remembers his brother. Mm. It's a tragic song, uh, thing. Could you so, play a little bit? What? Uh, play a little. היום אולי נתחד בו הלילה, אני תקשיב. היום אולי נתחד בו Beautiful, just so beautiful. Thank you. And uh, I see all those scales that you practice came in handy. You can look at the camera and sing. And at the same time, you're playing without looking at your fingers. A sign of a real pianist. Always looking to his, to his fingers when you sing. You, do you look to it? At your no, fingers? but some people need to do that. Really? Oh, absolutely. Wow. <laughs> um, you, you, we've mentioned a couple of uh, people who, and Jerry mentioned previously, all those uh, great lyricists. So I want to ask you, is it more enjoyable for you or does it make a difference to you if you write a song first and find the lyricist or that a lyricist comes and asks you to write? I, I, I compose both ways. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I hear the birds tweet and I have an idea, an inspiration and I write a melody and then I look, uh, I, I'm I ask, I'm asking myself who will write the lyrics. I have quite a fine lyricist, but sometimes I get uh, somebody gives me a text and I connect to this text and I like it. I like the atmosphere, I like the rhythm, and I compose to the lyrics. It's completely different. When, I, uh, when the song begins with a melody, I'm free. I'm free to breathe. And when I get a text, I'm um, confined, is this a word? Yes. Confined, why? Good word. Confined to the structure and to the rhythm and the, to, to the atmosphere. You know how I wrote Abani B. Abani B from the Eurovision contest. Uh, Eud Mano, my collaborator, my main woman, very much, lyricist. 
Um, and I, I we, we like to compete in festival. We were competitive, competitive when we were young. And there was a children festival, song festival. And uh, we wanted to participate. So he came with the, the idea of Sfat uh, Habet, the B language. This is the language that we as little children uh, used to, to speak that, so that the parents won't understand. It goes like this, A, Abba. You add, after each syllable, you add the letter B. I, Abai. You, you boo. Mati, Mati. <laughs> Mabati B. Mabati B, nahon? So I liked the ideas and I told, and I didn't say anything, I heard it, and immediately after the telephone conversation, I came to my mind the most cliche expression. Ani ohevotach. It was very spontaneous. So I decided this will be the refrain. Ani ohevotach in the B language. Abani B oboe bevolotabach. Now you know what is the word Abani B. And immediately I, I composed Abani B a boy band, Abani B a boy band, Abani B a boy band, And I saw, wow, wow, I have a refrain. What next? I called Eud uh, and I said, write some lyrics for the verse. He wrote very fast, he was very fast. And then I composed two of the words. <laughs> now what next? I wanted to breathe. I want a different, different atmosphere. So I said, I need to, to compose something different, the middle part. And I thought of the word Ahava. And so he took the word Ahava and he added words, which means love. Which love. Everybody knows that Ahava is love, don't you? Yes. Ahava, and then I, I went to the studio and make, made a quick uh, arrangement and a demo, demo tape. We chose Isa Cohen, the wonderful singer, to make the demo. And the demo was accepted. The judges liked the song. Now I had to make a whole orchestration for the... Eurovision Orchestra, and to my, I'm so sorry that when in my time there was a true orchestra, a live orchestra today, they sing with playbacks and it's a pity. So I set the arrangement and I made some think shamelessly. I repeated hundred times the refrain because this song is con confined to um, only three minutes. You cannot add three minutes on the stopper. So I say, what do I do to stand out from all the 30, 35 song competing songs? All the songs were new. How much can the listener remember after the whole thing? So I said, the best thing is just to hammer this refrain to the head hundred times. So I, it, it, uh, it uh, started with a, with a small and little hakdama. Introduction. Introduction, and then six time Abani B. Abani B, you boy. Abani B, you boy. Six times. Verse, again, Abani bi yobo then Ahava, and then eight times the refrain, <laughs> shamelessly. 
The first four, a bunny bay, a boy band, a bunny bay, a capella. Then voices. A bunny bay, a boy band, a bunny bay, a boy band, a boy band. Eight times, and in the night time, nine. Modulation. A bunny bay, a boy band, a bunny bay, a boy band. And it worked. They were probably dreaming about that song that night. Nightmares about the real boy band. <laughs> so this is the story how we, we composed and wrote this song together. We were very together. Eud Manor, who was the dancer in the student, uh, student group when he was a student. And I, I danced folk dancing also in, uh, professionally. I don't know if you know who Yai Rosenblum is. Sure. Have you heard his name? Yes, yeah. So he was the accordion player, <clears throat> and I was dancing professionally. And Eo danced, so we both have a sense of rhythm. Some, uh, some of my lyricists, no names, don't, don't have sense of rhythm. They can write ta 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 next line ta 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 they feel feel the verse with words and you cannot breathe Eld was different yeah um probably one of the most famous collaborations you had with Ehud was um Bashana Ba'a could you tell us about the history of that song and how it evolved there was no history we wrote an optimistic, rhythmic song for the duo Ilani Nilanit. I don't know how it... It spread its wings. Spread its wings to the whole wide world, to the Beta Knesset, to synagogues. This is the fate of a song. You never know what will happen. It's like... Ose Shalom, who knew that the love the synagogues in the world and uh, Ose Shalom is sung by Christian too in uh, chapels or in, uh, how do you call it? Church. Churches, churches. Yeah, you don't know what will happen. In, Just in, in, you know how many, how many people in all languages uh, recorded Bashana Ba. Among them, it was in 72, if you remember. Stephen E. D. Gourmet, remember? Mm. The Barry sisters were all the same. Not all, there is some young people in the audience. <laughs> e, Stephen E. D. Gourmet and the uh, and, um, Barry sisters and the Percy Faith Orchestra and even Andy Williams' ex-wife, Claudine Langer, who was famous for killing her boyfriend. Did you write a song about that? You know, Moshik, my husband, who sits near me and encourages me, you will see him, him later in our personal conversation. He told me that he was in a concert uh, in Las Vegas. In the Greek theater. Uh, no, in Greek theater. And he heard Hari Belafonte singing Mashana Haba'a. And do you know that Harry Belafonte has Jewish genes? That I didn't know, but he did make... Who well, uh, did you make? His, his grandmother has, is from a Jewish... His origin? His grandmother is from Jewish or, 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 origin. Mm. Yeah. You know, when Harry Belafonte sang Hava Nagila, yeah. it was a big moment. And I'll tell you, as a personal story, when you would go to a baseball game, they would play all the American songs. But I remember going to a baseball game with my father and the organist played Hava Nagila. And my father said, well, we've made it in America. If you can have Hava Nagila at a baseball game, then you've made it. Right, right. Definitely. Nice. I did, am I right that with Ehud Manor, you also wrote uh, Hashoter Azulai, the ballad for Hashoter Azulai? Is that yeah. him? Um, I wrote the, the whole, uh, the policeman, I wrote the whole score, soundtrack of the, so, of the movie, Kishon asked me, and it was a great honor to, wa uh, to, to work next to Efrain Kishon, because he's, 
a genius. Right. He, and uh, the policeman was the, the main theme. <laughs> Jerry mentioned the Golden Globe that we earned and the, and the Academy Award nomination. With one of five nominees, final nominees. I'm so glad, you know. I remember reading, Nurit, that that song was voted the best ever Israeli song for an Israeli film. Yeah, and it has a it has a long lasting power. How was it? Did you get a chance to? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the Israeli public audience voted, it, and the Academy Award, uh, the Academy uh, uh, Academy of uh, Film Music chose it the the best uh, song ever in the music industry in Israel. But I wanted to tell you. What happened the day Eld and I needed to, to attend the, the ceremony of getting the medal? It was on the 12th of April, 2005. We were prepared to go and uh, to get the prize. And at eight o'clock in, in the morning of the same day, I, somebody called me and said that Eld Manor passed away the same, the same day. I, I was in shock. I almost, almost got a heart attack myself. It was so sudden and the night before I saw him, we talked, we planned, we planned things and he accompanied me to my car and the next day he was not with us. I called his wife, Ofra, and I said, what, what do I do? She said, you must go to the ceremony and, and represent Elden. I went by myself and I talked about him on stage. And this is a loss, a huge loss for me. It must have been an emotional presentation. Did, yes, it was. Were... Everybody cried. Mm. Almost everybody cried. Do you, do you get emotional when you, for example, when, when Abani B won, it was not only a, a personal success, but it was a victory for Israel because it was the first time that an Israeli song had ever won Eurovision. Yes, I remember, I... and for the people in the audience who don't know, that means that the next year's Eurovision is going to be in the country of the origin of the previous year's winner, and that yes, I, is... I know. I know that in the United States they don't uh, value, they don't acknowledge this. Uh, but let me tell you that last year, a hundred and eighty-two million people in Europe watched this competition. You know, I I participated in two Eurovision competition in nineteen seventy-three. So I was the first to represent Israel in the Eurovision contest with my song A Sham. The, sing the lyrics, of course, Erod Manor, and the singer was Ilanit. You know Ilanit? Jerry knows. Oh, yeah. Marsha knows. Ah, A Sham, and again. Start again. I started with the refrain, of course. Uh, 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 I did the orchestration and conducted the orchestra 
it was important to me to conduct. I don't like conducting. I have not interested interest in conducting. But when I heard I'm going to conduct in Eurovision, I rushed and I went to um, Laszlo Roth, who is a very fine conductor, and I took lessons. I was terrified. That's why I conduct. I used to conduct only in the studios, uh, recording studios, to, to the mark the rhythm. But this time, I was, I was, my my hands trembled, and I had a shirt with hundred buttons. And Ilanit was cool. She is cool. She buttoned it for it for me. And you know, it was a nice achievement. First of all, why we, we didn't win because the first song, the winner was a better song and the singer was a better singer. And the second day, uh, and the rest of the first, I don't, uh, the first uh, prizes I don't remember, but the third was Cliff Richard. One before a sham. So, to be one step behind Cliff Richard is very nice. Exactly. Uh, I don't know who is Cliff Richard. Don't know. You don't know who is Cliff Richard? Of course we do. No, people don't say yes. Dan knows, Marsha, you know Cliff Richard? Oh, good. They are just not speak with the body language. Uh, behind, be, Behind your beautiful face is the poster of Salah Shabbati. So I want to talk to you about you that. Without eyeglasses so far? Um, yeah. Wow. Salah Shabbati, yes. It's so I want to hear about Salah Shabbati. Of course, you wrote the score. Yeah. And of course, you conducted the score for the whole run. Um, what was that like to conduct performance after performance of your own music? It, it was work for me. It was work for you? Yeah, no excitement. I had to, to, I had to watch the, the players, the, the musicians to play in time and to get in time. Were you able to write other music while you were doing that job? Able? Were you, were you composing other music during the day? Ah, of course. I never stopped composing. That, that's good. Yeah, oh. and I have all, always ideas. Not long ago, my last song I wrote to Yoram Ga for Yoram Gaon. He asked me to, to write music to the lyrics of a famous poetess called Zelda. I don't know if you heard about Zelda. Yeah. A wonderful, a wonderful poetess, and it was so hard. She gave me about six lines. They were not she gave me. She passed away. The lyrics were six, seven lines, short line, long line. I didn't know what to do with it. In three months, it, it was on the piano. I didn't know how to to. Like nuts. What do you do, you do with nuts? To crack it. Thank you. You are my personal uh, translator. To crack it. After I didn't give up and I did it and it became like a piece of classical music and I played it for Yoram in the telephone, in telephone and he loved it and he came and in one take he, he grasped it. He was fantastic and it's my last song. Mm. You know, uh, just like you received the Halal the Zimra Award at the, from Zamir at the Choral Festival, Yoram also did. Tell us a little bit about, about your relationship with Yoram and, and your, the relationship between a composer and a singer and how that works. It's two questions. Two <laughs> so, answers. <laughs> I, first of all, about Yoram, I have no, not enough words to praise him. He is one of a kind. He is, to me, the best, the best singer 
in Israel. He is like a chazan. He is fantastic. What's special with him is, why is he special? Not only nice voice and talent, he is highly intelligent. He understands the text he sings. Now, most of the singers have good voice. Ah, beautiful voice, but they don't perform the song. I know in Israel only two, two singers that do it. Chava Alberstein and Yoram Gaon. They give, they honor the, the word, they honor the Hebrew language, they live it. It's very special. And he's also an actor. A fine actor. Yes. He, he, he uh, stars in the series now. He is fantastic. He's a good friend too. A sense of humor. Just lovely person. Mati and, Mati and Nurit, if it's okay, I'd like to kind of interject with some of the questions that have come in while you've been talking, okay? Yes. Yes. Um, and some of the questions overlap, so with your permission, I'm gonna try and, and wrap them together. Uh, I, remember, I remember Nurit, um, when I was in Israel the, in, as a student in 1971-72, what was then Reshet Gimel on the radio was all yes. disco music. And then I remember being back later on and there was a slogan, a, a jingle for what Reshet Gimel had become and they called it Habayat Hacham Shel Hamusika Hayisraelit. They were playing only, only Israeli music. And I, 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 there are a number of people who have asked in the chat room, and it's a question that I wonder about also. Namely, um, tell us a little bit about the state of contemporary Israeli popular music in Hebrew and where you think it might be going. And also... Um, who are the contemporary artists whose work you respect? You know, I sort of, I, I, you say I know every Israeli song. I know a whole lot of music, but, you know, my love of the classic Israeli songbook is really of the period when I came of age and I fell in love with, you know, the classic Israeli music. But there are people making new music today, some of which... I don't like, and some of which I just haven't exposed myself to. Who inspires you who's making music in Israel today? Who is inspire me? Yeah. Whose work do you respect? And do you think, ah, oh, talented young musician, nice music. There are, there are several musicians, young musicians, but I don't know if you know their names. Uh, for, for example, Idan Reichen. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. He's good. Yeah. But most of uh, the music changed completely. The pop music changed completely in Israel. It's a world music. And listen, there are sect, categories. First of all, the Middle East singers are in the mainstream. They sing like Arabic this, music and the pop, Eyal Golan. This is one part. And Mizrahi. So, Mizrahi. It is so popular that you can, cannot listen to it anymore. It's, it's a, the, 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 you know, when, ah, how do you say it? Le salsel. They trill their voices. Yeah. yeah. How many trills can I listen <laughs> in one song? They trill and trill. The American singers have a long note and then they will, they will maybe trill a little in good taste. But, okay, now the other music is rock and roll, but the main music is American, inspired by Rihanna, Beyonce, rap. America is 
the last word in uh, Israeli music. You know Static and Ben El? Yeah, Static, yes. You know Neta Barzilai? She won the Eurovision contest. Right. So you listen to her, do you know what, what is the trend now, the musical trend? Some young people have a sense of a classical melody, but you don't know the names, the artists. But most of the music is uh, American. And as a, as a follow-up question, thank you for that. Uh, that's kind of sad to hear, but <laughs> I understand it. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the remarkable work that you do with Israeli school children on Shire Moreshet, you know, teaching them the classic songs of Israel. I know that you go around the country and you perform in schools. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, first of all, uh, I love to write children's songs. I have hundreds of children's songs that I are taught in schools and the uh, kindergarten uh, around across the country. But my dream for many years was that the Israeli students, uh, pupil students will sing my song. First of all, because I want to put a mark. You know, every artist would like to put a mark. Uh, and uh, did I say it right, Matty? Yes. Oh. You, you, um, to make more. their mark. Yes. And the, to preserve the good Hebrew language mm. through the songs. So, I, with my husband and my right hand, Moshik, initiated a project in collaboration with Misrada Chinook, the Ministry of Education. And this program teaches the children Moreshet, Tzionut ve Demokratia, heritage, Zionism and democracy through my songs. And the last 12 years, I've appeared, um, performed in about 760 schools across the country wow. and 600,000 students, which every year gather in the, at the end of the year to a very nice concert, about 1,000 children, parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters, all together and sing my songs. They play instruments, they dance, they sing choirs. Every, every uh, school has different, prefers a different media. Some, like Salah Shabbati, in many schools, the parents come and the uh, Place the Mabara. This I don't know how to say Mabara. You know? It's uh, temporary camps where people lived. When they came uh, to Israel, right. they didn't have uh, where to live. It's where Salah lived. For Salah in the 40s and the 50s. Right. So they put clothes and they play the Mabara people. You know, it's endless. And the ideas are endless and every concert is different. And so that it was my dream that came true. So I can rest in peace now. Oh, don't, <laughs> don't go anywhere yet, please, Nurit. I have one final question before we move into a different section of the program. Um, this series of programs that the Zamir Coral Foundation has been doing uh, started out as talking about music during difficult times. And here in America, uh, especially in the New York area, that was so hard hit by coronavirus, uh, the arts have suffered greatly because there are no live performances. And both in the theater and in the music world, there's a great deal of distress among artists and, and singers and musicians and and actors and actresses about the absence of performance opportunities. I know that Israel is going through its own uh, very difficult struggle with corona. 
what's going on with the arts community now in Israel? It's all, not only the arts, there are demonstrations day and night, every day for one week, thousands come to the uh, demonstration in front of the Prime Minister Netanyahu in uh, Balfour Street in Jerusalem, and it is, it is house in Caesarea, and they protest and pro protest and protest because there is chaos in Israel right now, chaos. They, for example, they said, say at four o'clock in the, they say one day that at four o'clock after, for uh, afternoon, the, the restaurant must shut, be shut. Amarti Nachon shut? Shut down? Right. So they threw the, 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 the food and it was so much money that they lost. And after an hour, they said, no, you can open it. One, one mouth said this, one mouth said this. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I, I, I don't really, you know, I'm not looking for political commentary, but really, no, no. I, I, I just know that people are, are struggling. And, and in hungry, and hungry. And they're hungry. And some musicians two weeks ago committed suicide because they were thrown from an apartment. Hey. But Jerry, I would like to, to end our section with a nice thing. Please. I, I, uh, Mattis asked me once, uh, how was it to get the prize of Israel? Yeah. And it's very, the most important prize in Israel. And when I was told, he said, he asked me if I was excited. So I, want, I wanted to tell you that prizes don't excite me. It's a momentary gesture of appreciation, but it doesn't hold more than a minute or a day. And I was not excited, only on the stage I, I was a little excited. But when I want to tell you that one of the times in my life, except the Eurovision, even I was more excited when two years ago, Matty and his charming wife Vivian invited me to New York to perform in the Zamir celebration, annual celebration in Lincoln Center. I'll never forget the picture of me at the piano 400 young singers with me on stage and Maestro Mati Lazar conducting and 2,000 people in the audience singing Ose Shalom with me. This is one of the great moments in my life and I'm not exaggerating. And thank you. Uh, Nurit. Not to mention the shofar you gave me. I got a shofar, an artistic shofar. I'm so proud of it. It's in my living room. Everybody can see it. <laughs> a Yofi. You yeah. provided me with the perfect segue uh, to close out this section. I don't know what segue is. The Ma'avar. Ma'avar. I don't know segue is a bicycle. <laughs> Zeloze. Zeloze. Yeah? No, okay. no, not that. Go no, ahead. Ma'avar mi chilek echad lechilek acher. What you, now? We're going to show a video of your performance of Ose Shalom. Wow. Perfect. Perfect. Ose Shalom. Vibroma v'yase shalom aleinu v'alkon Yisrael v'yimu amen. I've composed hundreds of songs, but this song is especially dear to my heart. It connects me to the Jewish people and tradition. Oh, shalom
Right. This was in Connecticut, <laughs> correct. It's at the Lincoln Center. No, we'll show that later. The Met? Uh, don't tell me, I want a surprise. To be surprised. Okay. I want to add something. In, okay, in your permission. What happened to me two years ago when I went to, when you invited me? Moshik and I went to see a musical. Come from away. Have you seen it? Fantastic musical. Fantastic, yeah. Suddenly, I hear my song. Ose Shalom Bebroma on stage. What is this? Nobody asked me. What about rights? Where are my rights? But I, it's not the first thing that I was thinking about. I am so surprised and uh, happy that the producer decided that this song will represent this prayer. It's called a prayer, not Ose Shalom. This prayer represents the Jewish people. It made a huge impression on me. You mentioned it earlier, Nurit. You wrote a piece, that, and ever since you wrote it in 1969 for the first Israeli, the first Hasidic Song Festival, it's a piece that will last forever because besides the beauty of the music, the fact is that it the really, it, it, the yeah, the Kila, of course, but it unified the Jewish people uh, across uh, whether they were Reform, Orthodox, Conservative, Agnostic, it didn't make a difference. People loved singing that song. It gave them and still gives them a sense of hope. And as you said, the Christians in church are singing this piece too, yeah. because it is a piece of hope. And that is a, an everlasting tribute to you. And it's a gift that you give not only to the Jewish people, but to humanity. Thank you, Nati. Thank you. Well, Nurit, I can't stop thinking about your exciting visit and performance at the 2019 Choral Festival. Uh, the concerts at that Choral Festival are annual highlights in the lives of hundreds of American Jews. And even this year, while we can't be together in person, we look forward to experiencing the excitement of the Choral Festival award ceremonies and evening concerts. Sherry, you're so right. We're beginning to come into the last, long, last stretch before our 2020 North American Jewish Choral Festival online. And in just two weeks from today, uh, for five nights, beginning on August 9, we'll be reliving and recreating some of the most exciting moments of Choral Festival's past, including our tributes to such luminaries as Nurit Hirsch and Ruth Westheimer, Theodor Bekel, Yehoram Gaon, David Berger, Flori Jagoda, Zaman Mlotek, and, and others. We want you to be with us. We have planned a really amazing five days that allow us to reconnect. On, on Monday evening, after a day of workshops, we'll feature performances from some of the amazing instant ensembles that have been created each year at the festival. On Tuesday evening, we're going to be reviewing some of the best performances by choral groups from around North America as performed at the annual North American Jewish Choral Festival. On Wednesday evening, we're going to be celebrating the next generation of Jewish choral singers with Hazamir and Zamir Noded. And on Thursday evening, we'll conclude with highlights from our annual Halel Vizimra presentations and end with the full group, everyone at this choral festival singing David Berger's beautiful Tfilah, Tfilah Le Medinat Yisrael. So please, if you haven't yet registered, go to the zamirchoralfoundation.org site and join us for 16 daytime workshops and five evening concerts at our 2020 North American Jewish Choral Festival online, August 9 through August 13, just two weeks from today. As Nurit uh, teaches us in her wonderful song, Bashana Haba'a, uh, there is always reason, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, uh, for us to find hope in a future that could be better. I think that all of us can appreciate the fact that we've been living through a, 
a pretty difficult and in many ways um, uninspiring year. And Bashana um, Haba'a, we only hope that Neshev al Hamir Pesef in his porch, Iporim no Dedot, Alevai, we should have the privilege of sitting on our porches and, and counting birds that fly by and thinking better and happier thoughts. Um, a little song to play us out with here. Next summer, we hope that we will be on our Amir Peset or in a hotel ballroom singing our hearts out. Um, but in two weeks, it'll be so great to see each of you in, in, and share our experience of being together for NHACF Online starting August 9th. So thank you, all of you, for joining us today for this, for this session with Nurit. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, Francine, for the behind the scenes work. Thank you, Larry, for helping with the video clip. Thank you, Moshek, Nibayat Levayat. And a special thank you to Nurit uh, for joining us from Tel Aviv tonight, your time. We leave you with a clip of Nurit singing Basha Nahaba'a uh, with Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, on stage in Lincoln Center, March of 2019. Wonderful to be with you, Nurit. Thank Shikot you Shikot. all. Thank you all, and see you after the coronavirus. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Amen, Rabbi Amenu. Nurit, toda raba, toda toda mikerva lev. Toda raba lachem. Zaya mamash me anev, incredible. Toda raba, Moshe, go, go, tagit, go, go, Moshe. This is Moshe, my right hand. <laughs> Don't see you. Hi, Moshe. Hey, Moshe. So it was very nice. Or was wow, it? it was wow. I hope <laughs> the audience also enjoyed it. I'm and sure they I'm sure they enjoyed it. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure I'm sure they enjoyed it. And I'm, I think they're still probably listening, some of them. But we'll we'll wrap that up pretty soon, Francine. But uh, for them. 
Um, I'm Steve Vivian. I, for some reason, where is she? She's going to come over pretty soon now. So we still have hundreds. We still have hundreds of screens watching you and hearing you, Nareet. Hundreds? Yes. I'm so sorry about the the beginning of the program, but I cannot talk and look at myself. I, it's embarrassing. Nareet, it, it, it's it's so refreshing that there's an artist. <laughs> an artist who's so talented who doesn't want to be looking at herself all the time because most <laughs> artists are, are narcissistic and they only want to look at themselves. Well, I'm not one of them. Come so, on, so, thank you for watching the, the video, the Zoom, and see you in uh, Connecticut. Uh, or, or whenever. Or in Israel. In Tel Aviv. Um, in Tel Aviv, my in, favorite in city. Carlton, was, in Carlton Hotel. Carlton Hotel. <laughs> Free publicity. Pirsomet. Lechinam. Okay. Pirsomet. Jerry, Todaraba, Marsha, Francine, everybody. Zaya Nifla. Zaya Nifla. Okay, Hitraot. Hitraot. Bye bye.